right, let's jump into our first uh, set of notes in molecular biology, which is probably my favorite unit in the year. Um, for some of you that don't know, I used to work on the Human Genome Project at Washington University uh, back around the year 2000. Uh, I worked in a lab for about five years uh, that was sequencing the human genome. And uh, some of the uh, things that we were doing were based on a lot of what happens in this in this chapter or in this unit. So pretty cool stuff. So we're going to start off with um, only nine slides, one of the smallest, um, you know, sets of notes you'll get all year. Uh, just nine slides, and we're just going to kind of talk about the scientists that got this whole ball rolling on uh, molecular biology and how it really kind of led to a whole lot of discovery in a really short amount of time. So uh, we're going to start here with Frederick Griffith. And so around this time, he was doing, an, you know, some experiments with mice, you know, a model organism. And uh, if you look at this um, experiment, couple things I want you to notice. So he's working with a couple strains, one called the S, uh, S strain or smooth strain, which is disease causing. And then there's a rough strain, which is not disease causing. And the smooth and rough have to do with how these strands right here of bacteria, the, the red and the blue ones, how these strands of bacteria uh, look. One of them had a coating that made it look smooth. The other one didn't have a coating and made it look rough. And so, um, these were actually strains that caused pneumonia. And so disease causing, so you inject this strain into the mouse, mouse dies. Over here, not disease causing, you inject the rough strain into the mouse, mouse lives. Okay, so we move on to this one down here. The S strain, right, which is the bad one, okay, that is the bad strain. But before they put it in, they used heat to kill the S strain, but then they still injected that now dead S strain into the mouse. The mouse lives. So they took the disease causing one, they killed it with heat, still injected it, nothing happened. Mouse lives, good for the mouse. Over here, they took the heated S strain, okay? And they took an R strain, so neither of what, neither of which should kill the mouse, right? Here's an R strain, mouse lives. Here's a heated S, mouse lives, right? Between these two, these two scenarios, the mouse lives both times. But if you do these things together and you put the dead S into the mouse and you put the R into the mouse, the mouse dies. So what's going on there? What would have, you know, what would have Griffith have been thinking here? You had two scenarios which typically do not kill the mouse, but you put them together and it kills the mouse. So, you know, you may already be onto this thought process, but the idea is that something, right, that is the disease causing agent from the S strain probably got into the R strain, which was still alive. This R strain was still alive, but normally isn't disease causing. So could something from the disease-causing S strain have gotten into the R strain? And the answer was probably yes, but what was it? Griffith didn't know. He just said um, that something must have transformed that R strain uh, into something that killed the mouse. And so uh, this word transformation um, is kind of attributed to Griffith because something was transformed from the S to the R strain and ended up killing the mouse, but he didn't know what. But this is how science works. And someone else goes, oh, okay, so you figured that out. Well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to work on that problem and maybe we can figure out what that was. And so other scientists come along and they see what Griffith did and they start building their experiments based on that. And they're like, okay, well, I kind of want to know what was it? What was it that was transformed? And so um, if you look, I know it's, a, it's kind of a lot going on in this picture. But up here, here is the um, a purified from S-type bacteria up here, which functions as a genetic material, will be able to convert type R bacteria into type S bacteria. So this was um, the hypothesis of Oswald Avery. Okay, and then he also had a few other people working with him. McLeod and McCarty were also working with him. Um, Avery bringing the lead. And so they wanted to know what was it that actually moved over. And there were a lot of theories. 
Um, and the theories are some molecules you guys know as well. Some people thought it was RNA, some people thought it was DNA, and some people thought it was proteins. These were all the leading um, uh, candidates for the, um, for the molecule that was transformed from that S strain to the R strain uh, that ended up killing the mouse. So starting materials, type R and type S strains of Streptococcus pneumonia. So this is, the again, the bacteria that causes pneumonia. So the way this works, and I won't read you through every detail here, I'll just give you the highlights. So they purify some DNA from the S strain, right, from the disease-causing one. And then they have uh, a few different test tubes going here, right? So they're going to have a control, and they're going to have one with just DNA. Okay, so you're going to have a control which wouldn't really have any DNA in it. And you're going to have another one with DNA in it, but nothing else. And then what they did is they took, um, in tube C, they put the DNA with something called DNAse. And if you remember what ACEs are, right, those are enzymes and they're named after what they're going to work on. So DNAse is going to break down DNA. And on the next tube, RNAse would break down RNA and protease would break down proteins, okay? And so the DNA that we're adding in each one of these tubes is coming from that S strain. It's coming from that type S. And so they've isolated the DNA. They have a control with no DNA. Then they have a tube with just DNA. DNA and DNAse, DNA and RNAse, DNA and protease, because they want to see which one is it that's really going to show up. And so um, then they go and they collect and they use antibodies, which we haven't talked about yet. Um, and actually, we probably won't talk about a whole lot this year because they took it out of the curriculum. It will no longer be on your AP exam. So antibodies can gather certain molecules because they have certain shapes and they kind of uh, can get things to attach to them. And it allows them um, to kind of clump things. OK, and so you know, they, they do this and they gather things and they clump them. And then they use a piece of equipment called a centrifuge. And a centrifuge just spins really fast, okay? Big piece of equipment that spins really fast. And actually now we have tabletop ones. I have tabletop ones in my lab um, in school. Uh, but I worked at the lab at Wash U. We had centrifuges that were as big as like your washer at home, which incidentally your washer kind of has a centrifuge in it too. You know, at the end of when you're washing your clothes and there's the spin cycle and the clothes are whipping around in a circle and there's holes in the drum. That's to suck the water out uh, of your clothes and start draining as much water as it can before you put them in the dryer. So that's a little mini centrifuge that you all probably have in your house. And so they use these centrifuges to then um, collect things. And so do you think heavier things in a test tube would stay at the top or would they go to the bottom? If they're spinning around super fast, then the heavier things end up drifting toward the bottom and the lighter things stay at the top, okay? So we have what's called, you can see this word right here, a supernatant or a pellet, okay? So the pellet, and this is a test tube right here, and maybe I'll just draw one over here. In a test tube over here, when you, after you spin it in the centrifuge, you can get a really kind of hard, crusty pellet down here with the heavier stuff. And then up here, it's more liquidy, okay? This is more liquid stuff, and so this is the supernatant, and this is your pellet, okay? And so they were looking at these different things, and this is the way you separate things out. And so down here in the data stage, what they did then is they, um, they plated... Uh, plate the remaining bacteria that are in the supernatant onto the uh, petri dishes and incubate overnight. So the first petri dish is the control nothing grows on. Okay. Second petri dish has the DNA, but nothing else that was digestive in nature, right? No DNAs, no RNAs, no protease. Third one had the DNA and the DNAs. And look at this disc right now. It's blank, right? There's nothing on it. The DNA extract with the RNAs, and then the DNA extract with the protease. And they both, if you look carefully, they're kind of hazy. Uh, they have, you know, a little stuff on them. And that one has some stuff on it. And that one has some stuff on it. But this one does not. Which means whatever got from that S strand in the um, original up here, whatever got from that S strand uh into the test tubes and into the supernatant was then digested by the DNAs. 
It wasn't digested by the RNAs and it wasn't digested by the protease. It was only digested by the DNAs. So this allowed Oswald Avery to initially conclude that DNA was the material that was transformed. And it was the one being moved into that mouse uh, that ultimately killed it because it was the harmful strain. And a lot of scientists said, yeah, that's all cute, but we don't really believe your experiment. There's a lot of errors. We can poke a lot of holes in your experiment. And we're not real sure that we agree with you. And so some people said, yeah, we think you're right. And we think it is DNA now. And other people, other scientists were still holding out. They were still doing other experiments that, you know, to them looked promising. And they were still thinking RNA and protein. And so while Oswald Avery did um, initially show that DNA was the molecule, science didn't really accept that as fact just yet. So other things were done. Other scientists um, started working on the problem as well. And so this brings us uh, Alfred Hershey and Martha Chase in a famous experiment called the Hershey Chase Experiment. So notice that uh, there is a woman scientist in this experiment, Martha Chase. Uh, I will come back to her in just a minute. Um, but they decided to use bacteriophage to figure this out. And bacteriophage sounds like a complicated word. A phage is a virus, and it's a virus that will attack bacteria. Okay? And so this alien-looking thing up here is a virus. And you can see all inside here in these red squiggles that that is the DNA inside a virus. Okay. So if you look over here at these actual pictures, you can see the actual uh, DNA that was up here is being in injected into the bacteria. So viruses insert their genetic material into. Uh, bacteria, in this case, E. coli, okay, another model organism. And so um, they were going to kind of use this process to their advantage to figure this out. So before I go any farther into their experiment, I want to remind you of something. What's the difference? Because it really came down between DNA and protein, uh, between the scientists to figure out what, um, what was the molecule being um, transformed or transferred into the other cells. So what's the difference between DNA and protein as far as the elements that go in them? Do you remember doing um, this early on? We have a chons and we have a chomp, right? So which one is which? Which one is protein and which one is DNA? Well, this one is DNA because it has phosphate, right? And you should also remember that a nucleotide... Um, is made up of a sugar, a phosphate, and a base, right? And that's in DNA. So phosphate is in um, DNA and sulfur is in protein. So what they did is they used a process. See if I can find it on here. You might notice how they're writing these things right here. 35S labeled, 35S labeled over here, 32P labeled. So they were using, I don't know if they actually have it on this diagram or not, um, it's kind of in bits and pieces, radioactivity and radioisotope. So this is really what we're talking about is radioactive labeling. So you can see the word label over here and then a bunch of radioactive stuff over here. Radioactive labeling is what we're talking about. So their idea was to say, well, let's put radioactive sulfur in and radioactive phosphate in and let's get them injected into uh, these bacterial cells and let's see which one we can track which one's going to end up inside the cell and which one's going to end up outside the cell and we can track them because they're radioactive so they put some e coli and so <clears throat> some e coli bacterial cells um, and then some 35s labeled um, phage over here and then over here on the other side, we have some 32 labeled phage DNA with some bacteria cells, and they put them in a blender, and then they centrifuge them. Remember, that's going to make these pellets and these supernatants. So over here, supernatant has 35S labeled empty phage. Supernatant over here has unlabeled empty phage. Okay, 
Well, that's all in the supernatant, but in the cells, in the pellet of the E. coli cells down here, uh, there was nothing. There was no 35S, okay? It was the empty. It was just the, um, the unlabeled phage DNA. But over here, the pellet actually showed the 32 labeled phage DNA was inside the E. coli. And it ended up inside there because the E. coli cell took up the DNA, but it wouldn't take up the protein. And the next couple steps, I've never used a scintillation counter, so, uh, but this is how they measured the radioactivity. And then they show you this data over here as well of where uh, the uh, 35S and 35P ended up, and that most of the 32P remains with the intact cells. And so this, once and for all, showed that, oh goodness, that's really bad, that DNA is the winner. DNA is the molecule that gets transferred. It was the genetic material of the um, S strain um, and the R strain back in Griffith's experiment. And so it's taken several experiments and several sets of scientists to figure this out. This is how science goes. This little chain right here is a perfect little explanation on how all of science works. This happens still today where somebody learns something about a protein and then somebody else pushes that information farther. And someone else pushes that information farther. This is how we build the information that we know about science. Okay. So real quick, I said I would mention um, Chase, uh, Hershey and Chase. Um, Hershey, Alfred Hershey was the... Um, lead scientist on the um, on this investigation, and he won the Nobel Prize. Chase was the research assistant. Chase did not win the Nobel Prize. Martha, Chase, woman, did not. She did not was not included in the Nobel Prize. Only Alfred Hershey was. Not only that, Alfred Hershey did not even mention Martha Chase in his acceptance speech for the Nobel Prize. Now, you might think, well, she's just a research assistant. She didn't do anything. Well, normal research assistants didn't get their names on things. Her name was on this research paper. The paper they published about this information, her name was on there. The experiment is called Hershey Chase. So she was good enough and she contributed enough to be, you know, noticed in some ways, but somehow left out of the Nobel Prize. And, you know, there's a lot of this going on now where, you know, still uh, in our world now. So, kind of uh, a glimpse as to, you know, what women have been uh, fighting in, in the past. And we're going to see another case about this uh, coming up soon here in another couple slides. So the next, the next question was, okay, we know it's DNA that's the um, genetic material. It's not protein. It's not RNA. Um, what's next? Well, what is DNA made of, right? So that would have been one of the next questions. And Erwin Shargaff decided to come up with an experiment. And he wanted to look at uh, the contents of DNA, and he looked at it for a variety of organisms. So bacteria, more bacteria, yeast, turtle, salmon, chicken, and I think humans wait on here. I'm sorry, the slide is cut off. Um, it's kind of, oh, there it is. Uh, so the human is down there at the bottom. So if you look, he looked at the percent of bases in, um, in the DNA. And if you look at adenine and thymine, adenine, thymine, guanine, cytosine, you guys know these, and we've talked about these. If you look at the percents, that's about 25, and that's about 25. This one, not so close in the bacteria. This one's closer. Now we're getting pretty good here. These are almost identical. The human is identical. Oh gosh, every time I go low down there, it brings up that other thing, so you can't really see it, so I'll just put an arrow. 30.3 for the human, for the A and T. These are also very close. So he started thinking, I think that these somehow go together and these somehow go together and that we should have a rule called Shargaff's rule. And um, there is a rule called Shargaff's rule. And you guys probably have heard this before. And we've talked about it a little bit earlier in the year where the, um, the A and the T go together and then the G and the C go together, right? And so that is called Shargaff's rule, and this was the experiment that, again, pushed information forward. So now we get to two people, Rosalind Franklin and Maurice Wilkins. Again, Rosalind, uh, one of the only women in the field, 
and she's is really good at a technique called uh, x-ray diffraction okay and she's actually method of x-ray diffraction right there so there's an x-ray being being shot at wet dna fibers on a slide and then the image gets projected onto a photographic plate and so this photo right here is a very famous photo and it's called photo 51 okay photo 51 and it's pretty controversial and i'll come back to why in just a second but she and um, maurice wilkins actually were kind of forced together by their lab manager uh, they work in england they work in a lab in england as did these people here uh, James Watson and Francis Crick. They were all in the same building um, trying to figure out the structure of DNA, trying to figure out what DNA looked like. So Francis Crick uh, was a physicist. He was really good at math and physics, and he was trying to build a model based on bond angle and how the adenines and the guanines and the cytosines and the thymines must fit together based on all of the physics of it. And James Watson uh, the young man down here, uh, who was only 25 at the time, um, is an American, and he's a geneticist. So these two team up, and so they have genetics covered, and they have the math and physics portion covered. And they're working in the same lab, which was called the LMB, the Laboratory of Molecular Biology, uh, in a very famous college uh, in England. And these two were also in the same LMB, Laboratory of Molecular Biology. and um, they didn't quite get along as well. Um, Maurice Wilkins um, was uh, firmly established in the lab, and the lab's boss invited Rosalind Franklin to come work with him and, in fact, take over a lot of his work. And so they were kind of had a rocky relationship, um, didn't share information between them very well. Um, but anyway, as the story goes, Rosalind takes photo 51. She's not quite sure what it means, she isn't quite sure. Um, exactly uh, what she's looking at, um, and what it really what really happens here somewhere along the line is Wilkins happens to show that photo to James Watson, and James Watson sees that photo, and some bells start going off in his head, and the uh, the the kind of the um, aha moment for these guys was originally they were trying to put the DNA bases on the outside of the structure and the backbone, the phosphate backbone in the middle. And this picture told them, it doesn't necessarily tell me, uh, but this picture tells them that the phosphate backbone should be on the outside and the bases should be on the inside. Okay. And so um, these guys then take off and end up winning the Nobel Prize. And in fact, they end up um, having Maurice Wilkins help them um, because Rosalind Franklin had decided to leave that particular lab and go work on another project. And so the, the controversy comes in, um, did Maurice Wilkins voluntarily show James Watson that picture? Uh, did Watson kind of take a peek on the desk, you know, under a folder without permission? Because uh, a researcher's work is their own property until they publish it. And Rosalind Franklin had not published this picture. But somehow it got shown to Watson. And some think that uh, that was, you know, not very ethical that he was uh, able to see that picture uh, because she was working on the same problem. And so um, there's also a whole lot more backstory to this. There's also a secondary report uh, that was shown by a different scientist to uh, Crick, and they think that Crick actually made the jump to the double helix uh, because of that report and not so much about Photo 51. So there's this whole drama going on. Um, it could probably be a Netflix show um, based on all the drama that was going on in this one lab in England. But Watson and Crick end up solving the problem. They end up working with Wilkins as well after Rosalind Franklin's gone. So what do you think happens? Watson and Crick and Maurice Wilkins win the Nobel Prize. Rosalind Franklin does not, and is not giving very much credit at all, despite her picture and a lot of her work uh, and effort were instrumental in um, figuring out uh, the structure of the double helix. So here is the double helix um, and kind of some uh, a few things that they figured out um, about the helix. And again, a lot of which was done 
um, based on Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction work. So uh, let's just start over here. So a complete turn of the helix is 3.4 nanometers. So for it to completely twist, uh, the distance is 3.4 nanometers, okay? So here's the line. So from this turn to this turn is 3.4 nanometers. And if you look at uh, the number of bases that are in there, there's about 10. And one nucleotide is 0.34 nanometers. So you have about 10 base pairs per turn. Okay? Her paper or um, her work also was included in this paper that Crick saw, um, Franklin's work. And it told uh, Crick as soon as he saw it, he was kind of leading toward it being a helical structure, but he couldn't quite wrap his head around it. But he figured out that the strands must be anti parallel, they're pointing in different directions. So while they are parallel, they are pointing in different directions. And you can see we have a five prime end here and a three prime end here and the same over here in all these pictures. And that's the opposite of this end, right? So here we have a, here we have a, oops, here we have a three, here we have a five, here we have a three, here we have a five. So that's the anti-parallel nature of this. And we're going to get into that more um, in the other notes. So I'll kind of stop on that, but just wanted to point out that was another form um, of information that Watson and Crick were able to use from Franklin. So here you see two women that played um, really vital roles in determining what DNA was and that it was the genetic material and what the structure was, and yet were not rewarded. Um, so that's how the story goes, and that's kind of uh, the, the intro with all the scientists here. And I do want you to know which scientists were um, responsible for which experiments and which kind of ideas were pushed forward based on uh, these different experiments, okay? All right, well, I think that is all we have, and I hope you guys have a great day. I'll talk to you later.